Nummer de paarden zitten in je spelen de sancti. Amen. So our saints for today, Saints Cyril and Methodius, um, were brothers born in the early 800s in the Greek city of Thessalonica. Uh, their father was a high-ranking official in the Byzantine military, and they both received an excellent education. And uh, Cyril continued with literature and philosophy. He became a scholar in the city and eventually a priest, while Methodius entered into politics and governance. So you had a pretty a good combination there with two brothers. You had church and state in the two of them, Cyril and Methodius. Uh, uh, Methodius uh, became more interested in the church himself, however, and while still involved in kind of political matters, became a deacon and eventually the abbot of a monastery. Uh, the Byzantine emperor, knowing of their capabilities, asked the both of them to go on a kind of a combined church-state mission to into a region controlled by the Khazars. Uh, this is what we call in modern day Ukraine. Uh, they did so and they returned successful. Um, and soon after this, uh, because they were successful in this one mission, they were asked to go on another mission, this time into Moravia. This is now uh, nowadays the Czech Republic. Um, and this is where they, they both became famous, right? Cyril, Cyril and Methodius are called, I think, um, in, in the Orthodox Church, they're held as, as almost equal to the apostles. And they were very instrumental in laying the foundation for um, much of the, of the Orthodox uh, uh, world as we know now, uh, as we'll see specifically by inventing a language for, the, uh, um, for those uh, kind of Slavic peoples. So they, they, they were given this mission to go into Moravia, and this is the beginning of that work. And with this time, we need to understand a little bit of history. This is the, the, the late, uh, mid to late 800s, and this is after the Carolingian Renaissance, as they say. Uh, um, uh, King Charlemagne had unified almost all of Europe, um, which, which it was the first time since the collapse of the Roman Empire nearly three, four hundred years previously. So Charlemagne had kind of united these tribes, um, but after his death, uh, it began to break apart. And you still had two um, kind of major Frankish tribes. Uh, these two tribes of, of the Franks, one of them was called, would end up being called the French, and the others were the Germans. But they were both at one time part of the, the Frankish empire, you would say. Uh, so the, this, this prince, the prince of Moravia, where uh, Cyril and Methodius were sent, uh, he had asked for help to kind of both um, uh, evangelize his kingdom and establish it. He needed the help of both the church and the state. His people were still, some of them, very pagan, and it was a lot of loose uh, tribes. They weren't a united kingdom. So he wanted to do both. He wanted to build a kingdom, and he wanted to convert his people to the faith. Uh, and so uh, what better team than the church-state combination of Cyril and Methodius? Uh, so the Byzantine Empire sends them into this region, and uh, of course, you know, between the prince of, of um, Moravia and even the Byzantine Empire emperor, there's political advantage they see, there's consolidation of kingdom, there's power, and so on. Cyril and Methodius, they don't care. They just want to convert souls, and they are interested in the Slavic peoples. Uh, so they go there, and they are uh, very successful. Uh, and the way they did it, they unified the disparate uh, tribes of the Slavs, by giving them an alphabet. They couldn't read, they couldn't write. They didn't even have, uh, you know, symbols for the sounds they were making. And so St. Uh, Cyril, using his uh, great scholastic background, invented a language. Now, that is extremely difficult. Imagine, you know, not having an alphabet, not having a language, and being given the task, invent something for people. And you've got to figure out, okay, what are the vowels? What are the consonants? What are contractions? What, are, you know, what, what sounds are, are being made? And how do I, I mean, impossible. You, you would think it would be impossible, uh, but St. Cyril and, and with the help of Methodius uh, de derived a language. Now, interestingly, uh, we, we know about the Cyrillic alphabet, which is used by uh, Russia, Ukraine, Belarus. I mean, all those, all those uh, Slavic areas, they use the Cyrillic alphabet. They have different languages, but their alphabet is, is fundamentally the same. But that's not what Cyril invented. 
His original language was glagolitic. That was what St. Cyril invented. Um, and it's very similar, but it was, I think, a derivation of a few hundred years later. The glagolitic alphabet uh, uh, was refined. That became, uh, that was called the Cyrillic alphabet, the, the, the derivation of it in honor, of course, of St. Cyril, who, who gave them the fundamental basis to work with. So, um, uh, so from this the alphabet, um, you know, he was able to unify the people, and, and he did something which, which would seem odd at first. Uh, so he began to compose liturgy in this new language, or not the new language, but he, he composed liturgy uh, in the Slavic uh, tongue. Now, this, this, this Moravia, this kingdom and, and surrounding areas, they had already been evangelized by the Franks. Uh, you, had, you had the Germans, you had the, the, the French speakers. Uh, and, and the reason that, you, you know, these, these two, we would think them two different nations, but it was more one nation. It, it was, the, it was the, the, uh, the Germans and the French. We know them now. Uh, what unified people was more liturgy. Liturgy is what unified people, and it was Latin. If you were educated, you didn't read scholarly works in German or in French. They didn't exist. You read scholarly works in Latin and in Greek. And, and when you wanted to do something poetic and, and important, if you're going to pray to God or talk to God, you talk to him in Latin or Greek. That's what you did. Those are the two major languages of the liturgy because that was the most poetic. Uh, but for the, for the Slavs, uh, there was political tension. And, you know, you have these Frankish missionaries and they're, they're, they're kind of, you, you can't escape. You're going to have politics in, in the church. Cyril and Methodius, they wanted to avoid all that. Forget about politics. We just want people to be Catholic. So they, they started inventing this liturgy in the Slavic language, giving people kind of an identity, which all the different tribes, they had different regional dialects, but they could have, finally, an elevated poetic style of speaking to God. So this is what Cyril and Methodius did. But of course, as you can imagine, um, no good work goes unpunished. So much opposition from the, the Frankish missionaries who were already there. So after spending a tremendous amount of time and effort, uh, uh, the, 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 the brothers Cyril and Methodius see, you know, our efforts are causing division. We wanted to unify people, but we're causing trouble. Um, they voluntarily left. And that, that shows a great uh, trust in God and a great detachment in that um, so often when people pour themselves into something and give hundreds and hundreds or even thousands of hours to a project, uh, it's hard to leave it behind. Right? It's hard to let go and give it in the hands of God. But that's what they did. Uh, in fact, they, so they, they went to Rome to kind of present their case before the Pope. And, and he, in fact, summoned them b before him because he'd heard of like, the trouble they were causing there in Moravia. So um, Cyril and Methodius go to meet the Pope, and um, he doesn't, uh, he, would, he would think that he's going to be like, you know, investigating them, or like what's going on, what kind of trouble are you causing them. Uh, he didn't do any of that. He took their side completely. Uh, in fact, he made both of them uh, bishops. In fact, he had to ordain, uh, Methodius wasn't even a priest yet. Methodius was made a priest and then a bishop, and he commissioned them and gave them authority over all Moravia. He basically said, you have litur um, ecclesiastical jurisdiction over that region. So uh, a quite a, uh, you would say, uh, a turn of events. They'd just been forced out. Now they returned as the rightful ecclesiastical um, um, uh, uh, jurisdiction. Uh, only Methodius would return, actually, because his, his younger brother Cyril uh, um, grew sick or something happened, but Cyril would die in Rome, and he was young. He was still in his 40s when he died. Uh, Methodius went back uh, to Moravia and continued evangelizing, uh, continued the work that he and his brother had begun, and eventually, um, you know, consolidated. As we know, that the, the language uh, that, that eventually Cyrillic alphabet um, really became widespread in the East, Eastern Europe, Europe uh, European countries, and they use it still to this day. All right, so what a testament to the, um, uh, the work and the genius of those brothers, Cyril and Methodius. Um, he would end up, um, Methodius also would write a code of civil law for uh, the Prince of Moravia, and that was used for hundreds and hundreds of years later as well. Um, so you, you see that, that God's providence in sending the, the, the two men that that country needed. They needed uh, uni unity in church and unity in, in the civil law, and they did, they did both. Um, a couple of notes. Uh, Cyril and Methodius, when they were there, 
translated great portions of the Bible into the new language they had created, teaching the people to read and write uh, in something they never had before, which was a native tongue. Uh, so this is, this is kind of a twofold repudiation to the idea that the medieval church wanted people to be ignorant and superstitious so the church could control them. Uh, the, the, the church was very invested. I mean, the church, Cyril and Methodius, invented a language so that they could teach the people to read and write. That's not wanting people to be ignorant. That is wanting them to know the truth. And furthermore, Protestants claim that the church hid the Bible for centuries and, and they, the, the church was persecuting John Wycliffe and, and um, um, uh, was Martin Luther for translating the Bible into a language people could understand. Cyril and Methodius translated the Bible into Slavic in the year 800. Uh, in fact, uh, the reason that there was no English translation of the Bible was because anybody who could read and write in English could read and write in Latin and Greek. They didn't need a Bible in English. Why would you have one? Read it in Latin, read it in Greek, that's closer to the original anyways. So it's, this, is, this is why it's important to know our history. So when you hear, you hear Protestants saying that the church didn't want people to, wanted them to remain ignorant or didn't want them to read the Bible, bring up this. In the 8th century or the 9th century, Cyril and Methodius invented a language, taught people to read and write, and translated the Bible for them. They wanted people to know. And there's many others as well. What do you think the first book printed on the Gutenberg press was in the 1500s? The Bible. And it was printed in not just Latin and Greek, but French and German and Spanish and many others as well. Uh, let's see. <laughs> so uh, uh, Methodius eventually, after doing great work, uh, uh, joined his brother in death and, and, and translating um, uh, from this world to the next. Uh, but the liturgy that they, they um, composed remained. And uh, we may not think of this, but there are uh, 23 uh, uh, rites in the Roman Catholic Church. 23. And they all have their different languages. There's the Eastern and the Western. In the West, there's Latin. Well, there's the ordinary and extraordinary form. But in the East, the Byzantine, there's, uh, let's see, there, there, there's Byzantine, there's Alexandrian, Antiochian, Armenian, Chaldean, or East Syrian. And among those, there are uh, Greek, Syriac, Coptic, Ruthenian, and Slavic liturgies. The point of this is that it doesn't matter what language liturgy is in. Uh, what matters is that uh, liturgy be arranged with a respect uh, of God's power, uh, a respect that he is God and we are not, and that we owe him deference and adoration and praise and thanksgiving. What has to go into liturgy is faith, is humility, is fear of the Lord, and all the virtues. Uh, when that goes into a liturgy, it doesn't matter what language you use. It could be Latin, Greek, it could be English, as long as the, the attitude is proper that goes into it. And by your fruits you shall know them. The fruits of this Slavic liturgy that Methodius and Cyril created was unity and it was conversions. That's what came out of that liturgy. Was it, was it in Latin? No, it wasn't. Was it at the traditional Latin mass? No, it wasn't. It was Slavic and it worked. And that's how you can look at any liturgy. You, could, uh, you look at a liturgy, doesn't matter what language it's in, if you want to say, is this good or bad liturgy, look at the fruits. What are the fruits of it? Does it result in conversions? Does it result in whole countries becoming Catholic? Or does it result in the opposite? You know, imagine, what if there was a liturgy introduced into the church, and after 50, 60, 70 years of this liturgy, there was widespread disbelief in the real presence, widespread disagreement with church doctrine, widespread uh, 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 flagrant violations of receiving Holy Communion in a state of mortal sin? What if those were the fruits of that liturgy? Is that a good liturgy? No. And guess what? It's not the language. It's not the language the liturgy is spoken in, it's the liturgy itself. What goes into a liturgy is what you get out of it. And if atheists and Protestants and Freemasons and heretics compose a liturgy, you're going to get atheism, Freemasonry, uh, abandonment, apostasy from that liturgy. What do you think we've seen in the church in the last 70 years? You connect the dots. Now, it's the example of saints like this, Cyril and Methodius, that give us that perspective. If we don't know, the hist if we don't know our history, we don't know the church. And so that's why knowing our saints and, and knowing a little bit about history uh, is important for us today. We can look at the past and compare it to now, and that's how we can know something is wrong in the church. So let's pray to Cyril and Methodius. Uh, these brothers gave their lives for Christ. They just did the work that was in front of them, and, and, and they, what the work they did lasted for a thousand years. 
We'll never know what we do, great or small, but what we can know is when God gives us something to do, uh, let's not shirk from it, but let's do it. Uh, respond with faith and with generosity, and let us pray, pray for, for those around us and especially for Holy Mother Church. God bless you all in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.